you're gonna find COPD an even easier chapter than asthma because there's so much overlap. There's actually less for COPD than there is for asthma because all of the environmental allergens, the emotional issues are not there. COPD is like the osteoarthritis of lung disease deteriorates, degenerates, nothing really that can be done to reverse it. You can just delay progression. Shortness of breath because you burn out your elastic recoil from smoking. So screening for COPD, no. Why screening for an aneurysm? Because your aneurysm, your abdominal aortic aneurysm, can be asymptomatic till suddenly it ruptures. So every man who is ever a smoker, ever a smoker, gets screened at the age of 65 for an abdominal aortic aneurysm because his first symptom can be his last symptom. But in COPD, they'll actually want you to say no, no screening test for asymptomatic guys because there's nothing that delays progression. And you're, you're gonna tell everybody to stop smoking. Are you telling anybody to start? I don't think so. So if we think about the smoking rates 50 years ago, half of people who are 80 years old were smokers at some point in their life. 55 years ago and 60 years ago, 60 years ago, 60 years ago, half of men and one third of women were smokers. And so that means that half of all men at the age of 75 and 80 were smokers. So you get shortness of breath because you're smoking, burnt out with the elastic recoil, uh, the elastic recoil, which is most of exhalation, is your ribs and elastic recoil and elastin fibers, decrease in your forced expiratory volume in one second, decrease in your FVC in one second. You should be able to breathe out 80% of your lung capacity, 80% of your vital capacity should be able to come out in one second. But your total lung capacity is, the total lung capacity is actually increased. What do you mean it's increased? How could the total lung capacity be increased? Because it's garbage lung, it's caca lung, it's lung you can't use, it's residual volume. That's basically dead space. And what do we call the dead space in the lung? Dead space. So your residual volume goes up at the expense of FEV1. Reactive airways are there, but about 50% of people will have reactive airways. And remember when we talked about breast cancer, it's better to have more receptors to block. Triple receptor negative breast cancer is more dangerous than people who have ERs, PRs, and HER2. So if you don't have reactive airways, there's not a lot of effective drugs. So the exacerbations, just like asthma, have cough and sputum and shortness of breath brought on most often by infection or just non-compliance with meds and infection. So if the case describes a person in COPD who's 35 and 40 and a non-smoker, particularly if it's associated with liver disease, if it's associated with liver disease, it is alpha-1 antitrypsin. Now, there is a reason to make that diagnosis because if you see this chest x-ray with bulla, 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 and you say that's alpha-1 antitrypsin, unlike COPD, we're stopping smoking and giving oxygen to hypoxic people, Wow, what a remarkable thing. See, it's not really a great, a great intellectual leap, is it? To say the person has a PO2 less than 55 and a saturation less than 88, PO2 less than 55, saturation less than 88, and I give them oxygen? Because in reality, whether it's COPD or anything, if you have that low a saturation or PO2, you need oxygen, because otherwise you'll catch the disease called death. But if this was alpha-1 antitrypsin, or you catch it young, you can replace alpha-1 antitrypsin, and that's why making that diagnosis makes a difference. Why not screen everybody for COPD? Because the only thing you can do is tell people to stop smoking, and that has nothing to do with having COPD, and give oxygen to hypoxic people. PO2 less than 55, saturation less than 88%. But no matter what the cause of that desaturation is, those people need oxygen. Those numbers are very important for you to actually know by heart. PO2 less than 55, saturation less than 88%. The most accurate test is pulmonary function tests. You'll see a decrease in FEV1, which will be less than 80% predicted. But remember that the thing that's different about COPD and asthma, 
But the difference of banking about COPD is it's not just that FEV1 is down, it's the fact that the ratio between them is especially down with a, a very low ratio, less than 70%. If they were both down proportionately, then it's not COPD, is it? It's restrictive lung disease if they're both down proportionately. Bistinosis, brilliosis, pneumoconiosis, co-workers, asbestosis, pulmonary fibrosis, if they're down proportionately. The, t the lung capacity and the residual volume is up and the diffusion capacity will go down because you can't diffuse carbon monoxide if your lung is destroyed. Now the reason that we use diffusion capacity of the lung for carbon monoxide is because carbon monoxide is supposed to go across easier than any other gas that we have. Easier than oxygen, easier than carbon dioxide, easier than any of them is carbon monoxide. This is part of the reason that it's so easy to die of carbon monoxide poisoning. It's also why urban smokers, urban smokers, people live around a lot of cars, and smokers often have five, seven, eight percent carbon monoxide levels in their blood all the time. Because aren't they exposed to a fire in a way? So they should be able to diffuse carbon monoxide as long as your parenchyma is intact. So from this point of view, then you might say, well, Dr. Fisher, that means I can't use the DLCO to distinguish between fibrosis and COPD. That's correct. They're down in both. One is down because your lung is destroyed and it's ballooned up into bullae, and another is, it makes it down because it's fibrotic and the carbon monoxide can't get across. But then again, isn't that kind of the same as talking about like diastolic and diastolic dysfunction, systolic dysfunction? Both of them have a decreased cardiac, can have a decreased cardiac output. Both can have shortness of breath. One is, does, has normal, uh, one has decrease in diastolic function, the other in systolic function, but the effect is the same. What's different, of, um, of course, is the treatment, just like the difference between COPD and restrictive lung disease. So here's where we get to finally something different. The differences between COPD and what we've said about asthma is that in asthma, the definition of the disease is a 12% increase in uh, FEV1 or 200 milliliter increase. But in COPD, it's not always bronchospastic, so it, reactive airways can be missing. And methacholine, if the albuterol doesn't help, the methacholine won't hurt. And that's why these tests are needed, because the more you have reactive airways disease, the more you can help the person. So from your experience on your rotations, you're probably used to seeing a person with COPD getting essentially the same things as a person who has asthma. And that's because it's what we can, it's, we can do something about it. So you, what are we doing? Hey, is that uh, albuterol, is that albuterol and like acting beta agonist and inhaled steroid really helping COPD? Uh, I'm doing it because I can do it, because what's the alternative? Suffer, do nothing. Reversibility. Half have a response, and of that response, the response is incomplete. So half have no response, and have the 50% that have some response, it's not as effective and complete as it is with asthma. So what is the big difference? Here's the next huge big difference. Is that COPD, given the fact that it is this way all the time, not reversible, not episodic, is that you get CO2 retention. So CO2 retention leading you to have a respiratory acidosis with metabolic compensation is not the I'm going to intubate you immediate disaster it is in asthma. If you're an asthmatic with an acute asthma exacerbation and you have CO2 retention and respiratory acidosis, you're going to the ICU and maybe intubated, but not so in uh, COPD because you have time for compensation. Now true, not all retain CO2. You have to have some really bad lung disease to get to the point where you retain CO2, but a medical student and a resident will often think, yeah, that's the norm. Why? Selection bias. Because who are you seeing? You are not seeing the person who's in the community without CO2 retention because they don't get admitted. Oh, right. In other words, you'd have to get the really bad disease to get to the point of having CO2 retention, respiratory acidosis with metabolic compensation. Now,
Because you're hypoxic all the time, your body makes erythropoietin, the erythropoietin increases the hematocrit. What's special about those red cells? They will be small because hypoxic erythrocytosis makes small cells. Same as polycythemia vera, because you're basically, you're gonna run out of iron and they make a, a, a small cells that's reactive, but the cells, the MCV is small. Now, this thing about having right atrial and right ventricular hypertrophy happens because you have, you have pulmonary hypertension. And why do you have pulmonary hypertension? You have pulmonary hypertension because you have bronchoconstriction causing pulmonary hypertension. Oh, okay, so what? Well, guess what? Big what? Because if you have an anatomic change in your heart, leading you to have right atrial hypertrophy, right ventricular hypertrophy, signs of core pulmonale, we give you oxygen earlier. Because if you've gotten to the point where the actual shape of your heart changed, why? Because hypoxia causes bronchoconstriction will give you the oxygen not waiting for a PO2 of 55 and saturation of 90, uh, sorry, 88, will give it to you at a PO2 less than 60 or saturation less than 90. So we give it a little earlier. We're going to say those again. Well, multifocal atrial tachycardia is a specific arrhythmia in association with COPD. What's the difference between that and AFib? We avoid beta blockers. That's about the only difference. Why do you get atrial fibrillation? Because it makes your right atrium big. Anything that changes the shape of the atria gives you AFib. The, the echocardiogram will show you these uh, chamber enlargements because of pulmonary hypertension. So pulmonary hypertension from COPD is treated with oxygen and correcting the hypoxia. Hypoxia causes vasoconstriction in the lungs. The vasoconstriction causes pulmonary hypertension. The pulmonary hypertension causes right-sided heart enlargement. The management of that pulmonary hypertension is oxygen. Primary pulmonary hypertension means your pulmonary artery is tight in the absence of lung disease. That has a lot different therapies to it. That is things that can dilate the pulmonary artery. But prostacyclin analogs, iloprost, epoprostenol, treprostenol, selexapag, they don't work if your cause of your pulmonary hypertension is lung disease. Bosentin, ambrosentin, masatentin, the endothelin antagonists. They don't work if your cause of your pulmonary hypertension is primary lung disease, is lung disease. Those things work for pulmonary hypertension where the pulmonary artery is tight and I don't know why. The mortality benefit, stop smoking. Yeah, genius, right? You need to come here for this to learn to stop smoking. And uh, if you're hypoxic, to give oxygen. Now, hypoxic means PO2 less than 55 or saturation less than 88, unless you have pulmonary hypertension or right atrial, right ventricular hypertrophy, in which case it's 60 and 90%. So this question, sure, everybody gets influenza vaccine, everybody gets pneumococcal vaccine, just like asthma. It's the answer to the question, who gets the greatest benefit? 13 polyvalent, then the 23, 13, then the polyvalent, then the 23. And inhaled uh, anticholinergics are generally more effective in COPD. In other words, in asthma, you wouldn't use an anticholinergic for chronic long-term maintenance until you got to drug number four or five. But in COPD, you can use it either that or albuterol short-acting beta agonist first. Or if they, okay, I find it highly unlikely they're going to say, should you use the short-acting beta agonist or the muscarinic drug first? Because you can go back and forth about it. And since it's not clear, because you could use either one first, the clear answer is if it says a person's on albuterol and they're still getting shorter breath. So in asthma, the next step would be inhaled steroids. But in COPD, inhaled steroids don't work as well because less than 50% have reactive airway disease. The efficacy between teotropium, eclidinium, umaclidinium, glycoperolate is identical. Ipratropium is the one we use in the emergency room in acute hospitalizations. The long-acting muscarinic antagonist 
teotropium, umicladinium, acladinium, glycopyrrolate are essentially interchangeable. Inhaled steroids is now a third line drug because it's not as much reactive airways disease and the same thing as the long acting beta agonists. Not to use them first, second, third here because they're not as effective. Pulmonary rehab is basically um, like any physical rehab. The more exercise you do, the more you'll be able to do. That's the same as a, a peripheral arterial disease. The more exercise you do, the less your legs will hurt. Now, theophylline, equivocal, small benefit, maybe, keep you off of long-term steroids. Roflumilast is another phosphodiesterase inhibitor of marginal benefit. Why am I telling you about it? Because you can be asked, and when is it? It's when you're on short-acting beta agonists, um, muscarinic antagonists, inhaled steroids, long-acting beta agonists, and you use this only in COPD. Now, here's again what's different. Lung reduction surgery is because the bulla squeeze your lungs. So the word lung reduction surgery is sort of a misnomer because if you get rid of the bulla, it actually makes your lungs expand, man. So you're actually getting rid of the bulla so the rest of your lungs actually expands in size, not reduction. So you're reducing the total amount of it, the size of the lung, but what you're getting rid of is dead space. You're getting rid of residual volume. Chromalin, unlike asthma, does nothing. Chromalin, the docromel, the leukotriene modifiers are not COPD drugs. And N-acetylcysteine is not only not helpful, it provokes bronchospasm. So when all the meds are used and you don't have the IgE drugs, like omalizumab, like you do in asthma. You don't have the eosinophil inhibitors, reslizumab, mepolizumab, dupalimumab. You don't have the drugs that work on uh, controlling the autoimmune aspect, because COPD is not, most of the time, an autoimmune disease. So you have less to block. Then what can you do? Transplant, because there's less to block. Asthma has more autoimmune components. You can block more. So what are the wrong answers? Inhaled steroids, single agents, not going to do, not going to help these patients at all. IV aminophilin is wrong for both COPD and, uh, and asthma. IV aminophilin is basically IV theophylline, not going to be useful. And using antibiotics all the time. Now for an acute exacerbation, particularly if it says more sputum, acute exacerbation with more sputum, acute exacerbation with more sputum, then acute short-term antibiotics, doxycycline, trimethoprim, sulfo azithromycin, but not long-term for people. There's no point in screening asymptomatic people because we have nothing to do to prevent it. And you're gonna tell everybody to stop smoking. Terbutaline has no clear indication in all of medicine. Uh, it's a fourth line drug for premature labor that's not as good as the other medications, and it's not better than albuterol. So it has no effective place in the management of either asthma or COPD. And that theophylline and roflumilast are basically the answer when you're on all the inhalers and you want to try to keep people off of steroids or frequent doses of steroids or frequent admissions. So what drug delays the progression of what drug, medication, delays the progression of COPD? Nothing. Oxygen is not a medication exactly, and that can delay it and stopping smoking. All right, acute exacerbations. We'll come across very similar to acute asthma exacerbation. What's the max of albuterol? There is no max. Steroids take four to six hours to work. Which is better, IV or oral? They are equal. We say that, that they're equal, and then we give them IV all the time. Antibiotics, if it says more sputum or abnormal x-ray. But the thing that's different about asthma, you see, adding doxycycline, adding azithromycin, adding antibiotics for COPD, just because you have an exacerbation is more likely to be effective than it is in asthma, even though half of the causes of bronchitis are viruses. So you're covering strep, hemophilus, influenza. How can you have hemophilus influenza if you have influenza vaccine? Hmm. Sinusitis, otitis, bronchitis is non typable hemophilus. And mozzarella, bugarellus, moraxella, cateralis, 
macrolides, second generation cephalosporins. The quinolones are effective in all of it, and doxycycline. It's unlikely you'd be asked to choose between these. So remember that you're more likely to get benefit out of an antibiotic for a person who's got a COPD exacerbation than in asthma. If there's no right heart strain or, eryth or erythrocytosis, if the hematocrit is normal and there's normal right ventricle, right atrium, then you would use at under 55 or saturation under 88. If there's right heart strain, you give the oxygen earlier. Must know numbers. So the concept that when you say to people that we're going to give you oxygen and uh, sometimes people get left over when they get told, yeah, people with COPD, you know, they have chronic CO2 retention and you know, their CO2 and acid doesn't drive their acidosis. So they're living on hypoxic drive. And if you give oxygen, you eliminate the hypoxic drive and make it worse it is completely inaccurate. Not only does giving oxygen to people with COPD save their lives, it delays progression of disease. So it's not that you put on 100% non-rebreather. No, because giving oxygen to a point with the saturation is above 90-92% doesn't help. And giving oxygen to the point where the PO2 goes to over 100 doesn't help. And there is such a thing as oxygen toxicity because it oxygen oxidizes tissues but it's not because you like suddenly drop dead from eliminating hypoxic drive that's why people who go with no nah wrong in coronary disease acute coronary syndromes there's no oxygen in acute coronary syndromes unless you're hypoxic oxygen can be toxic to tissues but it's not dangerous in the sense of eliminating hypoxic drive. That's an idea that was disproven decades ago. Let's review the long-acting beta agonists. I'm on albuterol, I'm on a muscarinic, I'm still, I'm on inhaled steroid, and I'm still not improving, and I might have a little reactive airways disease. I'm on a short-acting, I'm on a long-acting muscarinic. I'm on inhaled steroids, so I'm not sure how much benefit. I know Montelukast does not work, and Nidocromil and uh, uh, Cromlin don't work. These drugs, Formoterol, are Formoterol, Semeterol, Indicaterol, Volantarol, Olodaterol. Well, why are there so many, Dr. Fisher? Because there's millions of people with COPD suffering. 150,000 people a year die of lung cancer. That is 3,000 a week. But 300,000 a year, twice as many, die of COPD. Why does it seem that lung cancer is worse? Because it's more dramatic. It's more dramatic, it happens faster, and catches people's attention. But it ends not with a bang, but with a whimper. Most men lead lives of quiet desperation and die with all of their music still in them with COPD. 3,000 a week of lung cancer, but 6,000 a week, twice as many of COPD. The efficacy of umiclidinium, acclidinium, glycopyrrolate is identical. One is not better than the others. So you must always combine the long-acting beta agonists with other drugs. They shouldn't be used alone. And the place for ipratropium is in the emergency room because not only do you have to dose it more frequently, it has less efficacy. So teotropium for long-term use is both easier to use and has more efficacy. With large bullae, you cut them out so that the normal lung expands. See you in the next section.